Welcome to the GCN Show. Coming up this week, has the UCI now ruined gravel? We will discuss the fallout from the first Gravel World Championships. We've also got a new world hour record for Filippo Ganna, the reason why his bike will soon be banned, new UCI rules that we actually like, and the story of a bike share bike that was found 2,000 miles from its origin. This week, in the world of cycling, we learn that Filippo Ganna is now officially the fastest human on a bike ever over an hour. Uh, he smashed the world hour record and has set the bar at an astonishing 56.792 kilometers. Yeah, the UCI meanwhile quickly then moved to ban his 3D printed Pinarello. Kind of. Do you want to say more on that later? Uh, we also learned this week that ASOS have invented a handlebar bag that turns into a jacket. Oh, yes. And it's quite cheap for them. It's only $390. Bargain. Is a handlebar bag that turns into a gravel specific jacket peak hipster or, like the recent Gravel World Championships, just another sign that the bike industry created gravel in order to sell more stuff. Oh yes, conspiracy theorists came out of the woodwork or from under their rocks or whichever dark recess they tend to lurk in to pile into the aftermath of the UCI Gravel World Championships. Yeah, the first ever official Gravel World Championships, we should say. Now, people have been saying since the UCI announced their intention to add gravel to their huge roster of cycle sport events that they were then going to ruin this fun, inclusive and accessible form of cycling. So, now the dust has settled, have they? Well, there's quite a lot to unpack here, there I is. think, isn't it? I mean, firstly, what is ruining gravel? What could a race in Italy possibly do to ruin the things like Unbound, SBT or, or the Belgian Waffle Ride? That is a good point, isn't it? If you're worried about gravel being ruined by one race, I think you'd have to first admit that gravel isn't really as much of a thing as we all think it is. Are you saying that it's been made up by bike manufacturers to sell more stuff? <laughs> no, I'm not. Personally, I think whatever you call it, which is still an issue, isn't it? Riding mixed surfaces on a drop bar bike is cool. I've done it for years. I will continue to do so. I love getting away from traffic. I love the different challenges that you get from riding off-road. I love getting closer to nature. Nature. I thought you were about to say that. <laughs> Seriously, you sound like a marketing guy trying to sell me a new gravel bike, to be perfectly honest. But you are right, as much as I do hate to admit it. Oh, thanks. I mean, I don't think that Olympic marathon races put off the 50,000 runners or so that do the New York marathon or the 40,000 that race in London. So in the same way, will all the people flocking to Kansas every June be put off by the Gravel World Championships in Italy? No, exactly that. Exactly. Gravel race organisers should keep their focus on mass participation, shouldn't they? So giving value to the riders that pay to enter the events as opposed to the pros that go there on their sponsor's paycheck. Mm. I mean. The pro athletes are great, but they're just the icing on the cake, aren't they? Yeah. I think it's fair to say, though, that as far as an advert for gravel racing goes, the World Championships at the weekend maybe didn't do quite such a good job as we hoped for. Well, yeah, but was that just because we actually got to watch it live as opposed to just looking at really cool, glossy photos on social media afterwards? <laughs> quite possibly. But it did look and feel different, didn't it, to your typical US? gravel race. Well it did, I mean it was a lot shorter mm. wasn't it than we're used to, certainly the women's race which as we said last week should have been the same distance and exactly the same course in fact. Yeah that race. did feel like a bad move didn't it? Yeah. Uh, would increasing the distance have made a difference though? I guess it kind of would have done because for the women it would have been an extra 100 kilometers or so um, and therefore it might have slowed the pace down quite a bit. Yeah it brought different did. riders into contention. Yeah. That 100k is to get up to typical US gravel length isn't it? And yeah. so for the men if the distance had then it would have had to have been about 30 to 50k longer perhaps the Vanderpool group would have closed that gap Maybe. to the leaders but then equally I think we've still ended up with the same riders in the front group. Yeah, and when you say riders, what you mean is pro road riders. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, it? that is true. In the women's race, of course, we had two mountain bikers fighting out for the win. If you can call Pauline Ferron Provo a mountain biker, seeing as she's also a former world champion cyclocross and a former world champ on the road as well. But yes, in the men's race, I think the first non pro or former pro road rider was Matt Beers, wasn't Matt it, in Beers, 17th yes. place? Even his name evokes the spirit of gravel, doesn't yeah. it? He's got a great beer mat collection as well. Has he? 
Don't tell me you haven't seen Matt Beer's beer, Matt. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Terrible joke. <laughs> Terrible joke. The winner of the Men's Unbound race, whilst we're talking about mm. US gravel races, um, Ivar Slick. Mm. Whose name evokes the spirit of road, really, doesn't it? Does, it does, ironically. Um, yeah, he was down in 37th place. He's probably an ex-pro roadie anyway. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the Women's Unbound winner, Sofia Viafani, had been in the lead group of six, but then faded to 12th by the finish. Maybe because of that increased pace. Does this all mean, then, that gravel pros are basically just rubbish roadies. <laughs> I mean, it kind of feels that way, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, that's quite a leap from what we've just been talking about. <laughs> you know what? Had gravel racing already been invented by the time that you and I retired from road cycling, I think we'd have done all right, you know, with our off-road backgrounds. I know, when you think about it, it's just a shame that GCN was invented because lots of people say that it yeah. took yeah it took us away from what our natural calling would have been yeah. which is gravel pros i mean for a start you'd have really embraced post-race beers wouldn't you that is in very fact true. you'd have got to the finish line so fast in order to get into the bar first you probably would have won everything that's a very good point, Sire. Si, yeah. It? Shame it's a bit too late for me now. Or maybe it's not, because I noticed that Davide Rebellin finished in the top 40 in the elite category yesterday at the age of 51. No way, so a couple of years older than you. Wow, fair play. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> the other talk around the social media town yesterday was of how gravel bikes are either a con, because the men's podium all rode road bikes, or that it wasn't a proper gravel race because the men's podium all rode road bikes. Shut up. That is rubbish, actually, isn't it? And it just goes to show, I think, how versatile road bikes are, that you can fit 35 mil tyres mm -hmm. in a new Canyon Ultimate and win the gravel worlds on it in the exactly same way that you can win Paris Bay on an aero bike. Exactly. And no one questions whether SBT gravel is a proper gravel race, do they? Because I think that you could get around that fairly easily with 35 millimeter tires. Yes. Well, I can tell you a good authority that you can get around fairly easy on 37s. Oh, did you? Yeah, I did, yeah. Uh, right, go back to the uh, the event, the world chance being a good advert for gravel. As we mentioned, I'm not entirely sure that live TV makes gravel racing look as fun as it actually is to do. Cross country mountain biking had that problem, mm. didn't it? But gravel. Yeah, well, I mean, racing down a bike path and dodging picnic tables is great fun, isn't it, in yeah. real life? But I've got to say, it does look kind of weird when you're watching it on live TV with it pro does, cyclists. Yeah. Now, I think to do real justice to the event, you'd have to require a massive investment in broadcast infrastructure so we can get the images that we're used to seeing in the bigger road races like Paris-Roubaix or Strada Bianca. But also, I think, more static camera shots like you get in cyclocross so you can really highlight the technical sections of the course. Like slippery grass banks, you mean? Embankment, it's just too, too slick. And you see Gonzalez there giving up a lot of time, as is Raylan Nuss. So exactly. Uh, now, to get around it, you'd maybe need to look at a circuit based race Ooh. like you get at the World Road Race Championships. But then that definitely is not in the spirit of gravel either, it's is it? It's not really, is it? No. No, it's going to be really venue specific, I think. I mean, would a World Championships on the unbound gravel course? be good to watch on live television? No. Nope. I very much doubt it. I mean, it'd be like watching Milano Sanremo from start to finish, even though they don't get up the Poggio or the Depressor at the end. No, and also it'd be like watching them do the sign-on as well, because Unbound is longer than Milano Sanremo, isn't it? True, yeah, in terms about of duration. three hours. Yeah, exactly. Oh God, you'd have to watch the, the sign-on and the podium celebrations, everything, <laughs> wouldn't you? Um, so I suppose the question is, where does it go from here? Have the UCI ruined gravel, for a start? No. No, definitely not. No. Uh, but I think the race at the weekend would get a C plus from me. Good start, but could do better. Much like my school reports, that mm. every single one of them. Firstly, we need parity, don't we, between men's and women's races. We need more selective courses, it gives a little bit more racing. We need better TV infrastructure to get the pictures that we want to see. And then, potentially, the answer is a finishing circuit that will provide both of those, great racing and easy I think TV I'd agree with you, Simon. And as for who wins and what bikes there are, I don't think there's any complaints at our end, is there? I mean, yeah. that's what part of what made and what will continue to make the Gravel World Championships great. Absolutely, yeah. All sorts of different riders and bikes in the mix to win a world title. Yeah. What, what could be better than that? So yeah, that gets an A+. Plus. <laughs> More roadies, more man bikers, more gravelers. Let's get them all in the mix. Exactly. That'd be great. Let us know your thoughts on the races. Did you love them? Did you hate them? Did you race them, in fact? Let us know in the comment section down below. And if you missed the event, you can catch up on demand on GCM+. In all territories, including...
New Zealand. Ah, I hope wow. you New Zealanders made the most of that and you all watched it. Mm. Well, actually, one viewer, you reminded me with your comment a minute ago, uh, Tanya Nitschka wrote underneath last week's show uh, with the names of some of the start lists that up to that, up to that point we hadn't seen. Uh, and the reason she got one is because she was racing it. So, Tanya, let us know how you got on, whether you enjoyed it, what you would change, because we would love to hear your thoughts. I think it's a bit of a shame that Pogacci didn't ride. Well, yeah. he said, hasn't he? I saw on a website today that he wants to race gravel next year. Oh, does he? Mm. <sighs> There's no way to beat Vermeesh, though, is there? This time next year, has today Pogaccia ruined gravel? <laughs> <laughs> and now it's time for cycling shorts. Cycling shorts now, and we'll start with the news of the UCI banning Filippo Ganna's hour record bike. As of the 1st of January, a raft of new rules come in, one of which is that prototype bikes will no longer be authorised for hour records. And so Ganna's 3D printed Pinarello would have to have been for sale before he used it for the world hour record. Uh, to be honest though, given how high he set the bar right now, I can't imagine anyone really wanting to give it a try uh, in the near future, so I'm not sure whether the rule will ever need to be enforced. No, I'm not going to bother now. Um, what you're saying effectively then, Dan, is that the UCI haven't ruined gravel racing, mm. but Filippo Ganna has yes. ruined the hour record. Exactly, yeah. yes. Uh, there are some other interesting rules in there as well, though. Women's teams can sign replacement riders now if somebody goes on maternity leave. That's cool, isn't it? Yeah. Teams can change kits up to three times per season. That's yeah. presumably designs, not individual pairs of shorts. No, yes, just designs. And there could be some really cool ones, but I've got to say, that might be a commentator's nightmare during 2023. That's true. Uh, that another is rule true. is that following cars in time trials can't get closer than 15 metres to their rider after everyone got wise to the fact that they can create an aerodynamic bow wave to push their riders on. Aerodynamic bow wave, yes. <clears throat> Ineos, <clears throat> Dan Bigham. <laughs> At least, to be fair, team cars driving behind riders doesn't look as stupid as the specialised head condom. Well, that is very true. Nothing yeah. looks that stupid, Nothing is it? Nothing looks that stupid. Uh, now, we've been talking loosely about ex-pro roadies taking a kicking from current pros in the gravel world. Were we that explicit? I suppose we were. Well, we, we have been now, yes, okay. uh, The so, very same thing was happening over the other side of the world at the very same time. It was, wasn't it? Poor old Phil KOM Guyman posted a screenshot of the notification we all dread. Uh, oh, Phil. <laughs> uh, as he tweeted underneath it, welcome to Los Angeles. Tom Pidcock. Ah, yes. The old World Tour pro on holiday. Goes out for a little spin. Probably riding a rental bike, wasn't he, at the time? <laughs> Can I say, I still chuckle that when you finally lost that Strada Bianca KOM. To White Van Art. To White yeah, Van Art, admittedly, yeah. <laughs> For some reason, Strava, whether it's Strava just broke or whether someone there decided to troll Dan, I but they about sent it. him the same notification emails that he'd lost his Strada Bianca KOM, his beloved Strada Bianca KOM, every hour on the hour for three days. It was longer than three days. Yeah. I was thinking I might have to actually write to Strava at some point, see if they could actually stop it. <laughs> uh, anyway, there will be plenty more ex-pros turning to gravel or KOM hunting, or perhaps just following my lead and drinking beer and talking about cycling as of this week. Yeah, there'll be some people coming for your job, won't there? And some real legends of the sport, in fact, who've hung up their wheels. It feels a bit like a changing of the guard in many respects, does, doesn't yes. it? Nibali, Valverde, Gilbert, those are the three kind of titans that are off, but also Richie Porte, Nicky Terpsch, Alex Dowsett, and poor old Mikel Nieve, get well soon he starts retirement with a broken collarbone yes that was a horrible crash to watch from the EV on Saturday imagine retiring like that well yeah. I'm not even sure why they're retiring so early I mean Davide Rebellion as we mentioned just finished inside the top 40 of the Gravel World Championships and he's 104 years old he is yeah, yeah. Time. Uh, moving on an update on Zwift updates for you now and something that they're calling the Holler Replay yeah effectively it's a Strava live segment on Zwift, so you see a hologram of your best effort or your most recent effort, or in fact both, from a chosen timed segment so that you can see whether you're ahead or behind or you can try and keep pace. That'd be good for intervals, that wouldn't it? It would be, and this is exactly the sort of thing that, if it was around in my day, I'd have got extremely addicted <laughs> to. And I probably could have been seen on an indoor trainer crying my eyes out if I hadn't managed to beat my own time and my hologram. And I imagine that this is going to be used by a lot of very keen Zwifters and competitive riders. Yeah, so what we're saying, if gravel had been invented in Dan's day, 
you'd have been the best. And if this had invented in your <laughs> I day... I didn't say the best. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, yeah, I suppose at least with this, you're competing against yourself. And yeah. there'd be no beers and at the be end. that'd be very hard to beat. Holler beer at the end of, uh, a, of a swift segment. Anyway, some good news now. This is a story that was posted on abc15.com. A couple of months ago, Zania Smiley's bike was stolen from a school, which prompted her mum, Latrice, to post an angry rant to Facebook in the hope that the bike would end up being returned. It wasn't, it unfortunately. Was not but a number of very kind people from the local community in Maricopa, Arizona, offered to donate her a new one. And seeing the willingness to provide bikes, Smiley then decides to take things a step further and ask for bikes to be donated to other children in the area that were most in need of them. That is cool, isn't it? Yeah. On the first day, she was supposed to collect five bikes, but got 17, and in total, they've now collected over 100 in the local area, which are then soon gonna be donated to school children. Absolutely love yeah. stories like that. On a similar, but also very different note, another bike that went missing has been found, albeit, 2,000 miles from where it should have been. Yeah, a Divi bike, uh, which is a bike share company in Chicago. It was spotted in Santa Ana Mayo on the coast of Mexico, and nobody knows how it got there. <laughs> you know, I really hope that somebody did an epic bike ride to get it there, rather than it being transported in the back of a van. Agreed, that cool. yeah, that would make a great YouTube video, wouldn't it? Anyway, maybe we should get Hank to do that. How far could he get a Boris yeah. bike? Oh, I see what you mean. I thought you meant drive a transit van with a bike in the back down to Mexico. Well, that would make a good video, but actually <laughs> seeing, seeing Hank like in the middle of Azerbaijan or something on a Boris bike, uh, that would be great, wouldn't it? I'd, I'd, I'd watch that. Mm. Um, if you'd watch it, give the video a like. We'll see how, see how we can, many we can get. Anyway, in much better news than both of those, Bentonville in Arkansas will this week play host to the world's first ever bike festival for deaf people. It runs from Thursday through to Sunday with loads of skills clinics, group tours, and also um, panel discussions. Yes, the main aim of the festival, I understand, uh, is to discuss ways to break down the barriers that prevent more deaf people from taking up cycling in the first place, which sounds like a very good idea to me. Doesn't it? Uh, now, we'll finish cycling shorts with a quick shout out to the Rainer Foundation dinner. Something close to our hearts, isn't it? It's taking place for the first time in three years on Saturday the 12th of November and tickets are on sale now. Yes, formerly known as the Dave Rayner Fund, it's helped so many British riders fund themselves they attempt to make their way into the pro ranks. Uh, three current pros who've previously been funded by the foundation are going to be in attendance amongst others yet to be confirmed. Uh, the ones confirmed are Jake Stewart, Ethan Vernon and Fred Wright. Yeah, with others to be confirmed soon, yep. I think you said, yeah. Uh, now, if you'd like to go along and show your support, you can buy and find tickets on the rainerfoundation.org. Yeah. Oh, and just before we move on, I've uh, also got a new jacket for sale, did you know, over at oh, shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. It's the Castelli Perfetto ROS, which is perfect for this time of year, isn't it? Uh, those morning or evening commute sigh. That yes. is a seamless segue for me to ask you how your commuting is going. Uh, very good. Me and my zone, zone, zone two, two commuting. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, commuting I've been doing for the last decade. Uh, my zone two community, commuting, I feel quite fresh actually these days. I haven't done any kind of fitness test for a while, so I don't know whether it's got me any fitter, but I do feel fresher. Oh. So that's pleasant, isn't yes. it? Well, um, I wish I could say you look fresher. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know that's a lie, Dan. It is now time for Hack Forward Slash Bodge of the Week. Uh, first one this week comes in from Evan Murau. Murau? Uh, old bike frame bike rack. A bike rack made from repurposed bike frames and forks at my local cidery. A cidery. Oh, that sounds cool. So it's a hack, just because it's a cidery. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a hack generally, I think, isn't it? That's quite cool. So, yeah. I like that. If, if they can't be used as bikes anymore, then any sort of repurposing of them is a hack from me. Can and as a bike rack, right? that's good. Is that a Univega? It is, yeah. Did well, you have a well Univega spotted. once? No, I didn't. I never did. I don't know why. I seem to have it in my mind that you raced for Univega. No, never did. I think I, I probably apply on a number of occasions. <laughs> uh, is, it, is it Guy Atherton, wasn't it, used to ride for Univega? I used to like their kit as well. We're going back to we some are. pretty early 90s mountain biking late, in the UK, aren't we? 90s, Quite niche. Um, uh, I'm going hack. I'm going hack. But can I just say, this is more of a gripe about bike racks generally. They're always metal, right? Mm. But when you lean your bike up against a metal bike rack, it's well scratchy, isn't yeah. it? Can we not just have a bit of rubber coating on bike racks just yeah, to point. soften the blow a little bit? Don't know. Yeah, I'll make them out of wood. <laughs> Get a hacksaw. <laughs> 
Uh, right, anyway, 87% uh, of you yes. lot thought that was a hack. So, uh, so pretty good work to that local cidery. Next up, we've got this one sent in by Poison Spider. That's a cool username, isn't it? I like that. Um, homemade bike storage. When I moved in with my partner, she let me have the double garage as my bike cave on one condition, that uh, she wanted to keep her old Ford Puma that had significant sentimental value in her half of the space. With seven bikes to spot store, my half is a bit crowded. Um, so I've hung them over the top of her car on a series of tracks with independent sliding carriages. Oh, wow, well, I didn't see that before. Sliding carriages. That is incredible. I just thought you'd just sort of like drill yeah. some hooks into now the ceiling. I, but I, yeah, on, on first look, that is what I assumed as well. That is amazing. Is there some sort of pulley system as well? I mean, that's the next level, surely. Oh, that's a hack what, from hey, me. That's a monster hack. Hack from me, but can I just ask, how nervous are you sliding your bikes above your partner's I'd imagine Ford less Puma? so. Less so over Ford Puma, I'd have thought. <laughs> <You> <laughs> if think? it was a Ferrari or something. <laughs> Mate, sentimental value. <laughs> uh, no, I, that's a hack. That's absolutely inspired. Yeah. I love it. I mean, it was going to be a hack for me anyway, before the slider system even came into play. 95% um, of you voted that one a hack, which I'm very pleased to see. Yeah. Next one comes in from Berno Taboten. Berno Taboten. Uh, have I got that wrong? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, <it's> just... Permanent <laughs> top tube bag attachment. I want a top tube bag for my commuter bike with theft resistant attachment. I've got a cheap top tube bag cut off the headset strap, drilled four millimeter holes into the top tube. Is that all right? Drilling holes, I guess it's alloy, isn't it? I used pop rivets. The result was bad as the bag flopped around. So I made holes in the bag and clapped the bottom side of the bag to the top tube with a zip tie. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Much more rigid now. <laughs> However bodgy looking with the zip tie. Oh God. So you basically, you've drilled your frame out realize that that hasn't worked and so you've done what you could have done originally which is zip tie your frame bag on which isn't very theft proof i guess but surely um, surely it's not that hard for thieves to get into the bag anyway even if they can't take the bag <laughs> <laughs> unless there's some sort of padlock on the zip i don't know <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, we, I think we're missing something. <laughs> oh dear. I'm going to say... <laughs> All right. Well, you're, you're in the majority, side. Si. Am I? I think that. 85% of yeah. other people might have decided that um, the theft of the contents might still be a possible viability. Yeah. 85% um, said bodge. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I love the ending as well. <laughs> <laughs> Most significant downside is that if I decide to take it off, there will be pop rivet parts stuck in the top tube jinging around. So <laughs> you're totally screwed. <laughs> is that a pun? No. <laughs> I, think I better do the last one, otherwise the show will never finish. Oh, sorry. Uh, right, Ian Iscalati. Max spray coverage. I commute a lot and it rains every day here in Switzerland. My bike setup was pretty good, except the front wheel spray getting on my legs and feet depending on the wing direction. So it looks uh, like Ian has just extended the front mudguard and what a neat job he's done of it. That does look pretty incredible, doesn't it? So if, is that modifying a pannier rack or is that creating a pannier rack out of your new front mudguard? Rack. We have no more details supplied. Other than it looks super duper neat. And I do wonder, like, if if Ian's issue is presumably one that plagues all of us, why do people not have more mudguards that extend over the front wheel? Is there like a safety thing there? I can't see there would be. No, not with the wheel travelling forwards. No. How um, weird is that? No idea, but that is a hack from me because the new part of the mudguard looks even more professional than the original part. Yeah, it's got to be said, I'd replace the original part with whatever with you the make the new of, yeah. part out because because uh, that's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, no, it's a hack from me as well. Uh, and it's a hack from 63% of you, so 37% <laughs> said that that was a bodge. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to look at next week's <laughs> quite frankly. Oh, I'm, and apologies for getting the giggles there. I don't know why that one made me laugh so much. But there you go. 
It's time now for Capture Competition, that part of the show where you get your chance to get your hands on a coveted GCN Elite water bottle. All you gotta do is put a witty caption in the comments section down below. We'll pick a winner next week. But first, as always, it's results time. It is. Here is your photo from last week. And our winner, very deserving winner, I've got to say this week, is Max De Reuter. Not that all winners aren't deserving, of course. Uh, caption competition, in order for Elisa to nail the fist bump, she will need some education first. Nice. There well you go. Well done, Max. Tell you what, Max, get in touch with us on Facebook and we'll put this in the easy post. Oh! Almost good. Thanks. <coughs> uh, right, uh, go on then, Dan. Do you want to, uh, people are going to be in tears of laughter at home like you were during Hack and Bodge. Probably, probably. Um, right, so the photograph for this week is uh, is the men's podium at, what's that, the Munster Tour? Uh, Munster, uh, Sparkerson Munsterland Jira, I think it is. Ah, oh, yes. I've got that, that one. Right. Uh, yeah, I will get you started with something that I've already put on Twitter, actually. When you realise it's 0% beer. <laughs> I just love the face of Jasper Philipson holding up that huge 0% glass of beer on the podium. He looks disgusted, doesn't he? He does look absolutely revolted at the prospect. But uh, but there you go. Uh, right, if you think you can... Uh, well, it's irrelevant, actually, what Dan's just said, because mm. uh, you're not competing for a bottle, unfortunately, are you? No. No. Uh, so, yeah, get involved in the comments section. We'll pick a winner next week. We will shortly tell you what we've got coming up on GCN this week, but first up, a few comments from last week. Uh, we had a plumber get in touch about that toilet hack. That we did Sorry. indeed. So that was where someone had replaced the flush with uh, with a, a brake, basically. A, a, so they had a handlebar, it's very neat. We'll probably best show a picture, actually. So it wasn't explaining. Neat. Well, part of the reason I said Bodge, well, when I looked back at it, was because it didn't look like the cleanest toilet or cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you wouldn't you wouldn't stipulate that someone cleaned their bike in order to get a hack, would you? No, Why would you have to clean no, the dog? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, there we go. What we did wonder is whether or not a cable actuated flush mechanism was the most appropriate mm. for the job, yes. basically. And would hydraulics have been better? Anyway, Bo H said, uh, I agree. The cable will eventually corrode. It also depends on the amount of water in the tank. A normal four or five gallon tank only had about four inches of tank above the water line. So there you go. Mm. So Cy si was right and I was wrong, according oh, to yeah. our experts. Uh, also underneath last week's show, Tom Arnold wrote in and said, you set my Alexa off. She started shouting about what I really <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes uh, one of our colleagues uh, here at GCN actually, Steve, who you will know from the GCN Cat D Zwift team, uh, also <laughs> sent Lloydie a text complaining of exactly the same thing. <laughs> uh, Alexa, define irony. Yes, Sean admitted to feeling a little bit silly because he left his bike unlocked. To convey a meaning that is the opposite of its literal meaning. There you go. Proof. It happens. It's true. Yes. Alexa, who's the best GCN presenter? I wonder what you're going to say to that. Hey? Will she answer? Is that what she does? No idea. No idea. Okay. Depends on whether it's going to be found on the internet or not. Uh, so <laughs> probably say Manon immediately. Uh, John Andrews put down, if you want to unload a Campy SR cassette, uh, super record, 11 to 23, let me know. I'd love to treat um, work a treat on my Pegoretti built Pinarello. See? Our advertising started to work. There you so. go. John Andrews, who lives in either the either Florida or the Netherlands, I suspect, with an 1123 <laughs> cassette on. Um, they are things of beauty, aren't they? 11 to 23, 11 speed cassettes. No, I don't like the look at them. Do you not? No. They're amazing. No, yeah. I don't, it just makes it look old to me. It does look quite old, yeah. to be fair. Yeah, anyway, moving swiftly on. Uh, under how to carry essential spares, Santiago Benito said, I now tow a small trailer containing a completely stocked toolbox, a small air compressor, a work stand, and of course a mini fridge that runs on solar. You can never be too prepared, <laughs> in my opinion. And dragging the extra weight around has really got me in fantastic shape. So there you go, that's a, a nice spin on it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I noticed, Si, under gravel mistakes to avoid, that out trigger put, I'd love to see Dan Lloyd do a gravel race. Uh, a few people said that because Manon pointed out that of all the current GCN English speaking presenters, I'm the only one that's not competed at a gravel race. But unfortunately, I think the time's passed for me, Si. Well, that's so. it. You just have to console yourself with the knowledge that had gravel been invented when you retire, you would have been the best hmm. in the world. I that's mean, it. I th I'd say Strada Bianca is kind of a gravel race. Well, that's it. And yeah. you came ninth at that? Yeah. 
back in the days when people didn't take it very seriously. <laughs> Got in early, didn't I? Uh, also under that um, Ride Slow to Ride Fast video of Inigo San Milan, Tade Pogaccia's coach, which lots of you loved, uh, Carl Knudsen put, what size is 39? I thought it was his late 20s. Uh, plus guitar and stuff put, what size turning 40? Man, you look great. Thanks. Thank you so much, guys. I've got those um, comments printed out and they're stuck uh, behind my desk. So uh, just a bit of motivation there. Mm. But, uh, but yeah. And, uh, and thanks, Dan, as well, for the makeup tips. Well, <laughs> that's, that's really helped. Did you use those filters. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, these past five years, it's really helped. Uh, right then, underneath the 10 espresso ride, um, a lot of amazing comments under there. So it's absolutely brilliant to read them. Katie L said uh, that Ollie's secret weapon, bear in mind, Ollie was effectively immune to caffeine, weirdly. Uh, she said his secret weapon is his PhD. You either build up a massive tolerance to caffeine or you drop out before your thesis is done. There are no <laughs> other options. And the amount of people that mention PhDs on that, I suspect that really is a thing. 437 likes that comment got. Really? So, uh, yeah, well done, Katie. Yeah. That's a lot of people that understand what it's like to do a PhD. A lot of people, yeah. Oh, that would, it's quite frightening we've got a, a, an audience that intellectual, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's it, that's true. Um, and then also, uh, finally, Aaron War. after all the attempts on Hank's life, I didn't think the one to get closest would be a simple cafe <laughs> ride. It was actually a little bit frightening to see him coming undone. Mm. Like, Hank grumpy and, like, generally upset and tired and, yeah. you know, it was a bit he, like... I mean, he actually has started to look in his late 30s, hasn't he? He has, yeah. yeah. Right, coming up on the channel this week, on Wednesday, uh, how to use Zwift. And yes, we know we've done this before, but of course there's been a lot of changes on the platform since we originally did that how-to video. So we explain all of its new features as well as the basics. On Thursday, how to avoid bike packing disaster. And it's not pulling a solar powered trailer along with a fridge and all of your spare parts and tools, etc. Now, I've not seen this one yet, so I'm not entirely sure what Connor is up to, but there we go. Um, on Friday, another one of Connor's, small bike, tall rider, which uh, the mind boggles at what he's got in store, but um, anyway, he's definitely a tall rider, so we'll see where that <laughs> one goes. On Saturday, we've got a deep dive into the myths surrounding pedaling technique. Okay, so if you enjoyed Friday's video with Inigo Samalan, then check out this one as well, because um, Connor really goes into the details. Fascinating insights in that one. And then you'll remember us talking on the show a couple of weeks ago about Mark Beaumont attempting the North Coast 500 and trying to get the record for that. So uh, we have the GCN video. The documentary is coming to GCN Plus a little bit later, but we have a GCN video from the perspective of Hank mm. from the following car. So uh, it's going to be quite intriguing. Be, yeah. Yeah. And talking of GCN Plus, the road season might be winding down. It's still a busy week. We've got the eight-day Tour de Langkawi starting today, so that will already be available on demand. It runs through to next Tuesday. Uh, we've also got the Giro del Veneto and the Veneto Classic, the last one-day races in Italy, plus the UCI World Track Championships. They haven't ruined that. No. Nope. Uh, that comes up from Thursday through to Sunday. It might be Wednesday through to Sunday, actually. And this weekend, round two of the UCI Cyclocross World Cup from Fayetteville, which uh, many of you remember hosted the World Championships back in January. Yeah, cross is seriously good, as always, this season. Oh, I have to say territory restrictions apply, sorry. New Zealand. <laughs> Well, in uh, the UCI events, barring the gravel world, it's Europe excluding Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Italy and Belgium. It's good that race rights are so straightforward, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice I and love clear. It. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Yeah. Um, one thing that is available totally worldwide and which you should not miss is uh, Killian Kelly, our man Killian. Uh, you'll know, of course, that he trained up for the Adapter Tour this summer. You can finally watch how we got on, and that is live as of now, in fact. It Zero is. to Hero is up on GCN Plus, and it is a cracking watch, so do make sure you check it out. I don't know if you noticed, Si, but in our Monday morning meeting, the head of Docs mistakenly said um, Hero to Zero. <laughs> Did she? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, poor old Killian. Si, yeah, I had a chuckle. <laughs> right, that's all for this week's GCN show, but we'll be back, of course, this time next week.